I am standing at a stadium near Corinth during the time of Paul. This was a stadium used for foot races and other athletic events. But a stadium like this would not only be used for athletic events. Another usage for a stadium like this would be what's called a processional. A processional would happen at time of war. When the people from this town came home after a victory, there would be a processional or a parade. It would be led by the highest ranking army officer of this town and they would follow him based on descending order of rank until in the very back of the processional would be the prisoners. They would be tied together or chained together. And the people of the town would gather on the sides of the road to celebrate the victors, but also to abuse the prisoners and they would be encouraged to say what they wanted to say, to spit on them, and to throw things at them. Eventually, that processional would end at a stadium like this. They would be brought through a tunnel and come into the stadium where the town would gather. And often here, what would happen is they would have the prisoners fight each other to the death, or they would bring animals in here to fight against the prisoners, or perhaps the conquering army would kill the prisoners in front of their hometown but it was for sport, it was for entertainment. As we consider this passage today, the very end of Paul's section where he's fighting for unity, he's going to talk about how we should think about the leaders of the church and treat the leaders of the church. It's 1 Corinthians chapter four. And this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty, we are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit?
morning. Welcome to Northridge. My name's Aaron. I'm the youth pastor here. And whether you're joining us from Aranda Corrid or Webster or Greece or online, we're so glad you're here. And uh, today we are going to be talking about uh, leaders and putting pastors in their place. Um, but before we, before we really jump into that whole thing, I just want to talk about how we evaluate people in general, just to get our kind of brains warmed up about um, how, we, how we evaluate people in general. And I think that there are some people who everyone kind of naturally likes. You can't not like certain people. Like, for instance, we're going to go through some examples. First of all, I think you can't not like Mr. Rogers, right? I mean, he wants to be your neighbor. He's super friendly. Some of those puppets were a little weird, but I like him. He's great. Next, I mean, you can't not like Barney Fife, right? You know, Mayberry, he's just so self-effacing. It makes everybody feel good about themselves. Everybody likes Barney Fife, right? Or, you know, you've got, everybody loves Raymond, right? Everybody loves the show. Everybody loves, okay, you get it? Okay, just making sure everybody got it. There's a show. If you don't know about it, ask somebody. Okay, we also, you've got to like, you got to like Julie Andrews, right? I mean, it's the 50th anniversary of the release of Sound of Music. She's just a classy actress, really regal. You, you got to like, you got, you know, Mary Poppins. You got to like Julie Andrews. Finally, you know, another one. You've got to like Tom Brady. You know what I mean? Everybody likes Tom Brady. <laughs> everybody like. What? Everybody doesn't? What? He wins a bunch of Super Bowls. This is a great quarterback. I mean, I call him a winner. You might call him a cheater. But everybody likes him, you know? I think Tom Brady's actually probably a good segue into a different kind of person. This is the kind of person who's naturally polarizing. Man, you put up a picture of Tom Brady and immediately the room divides, you know what I mean, into winners and losers, right? Um, People immediately divide. They're polarizing. Another guy that might be kind of polarizing is Tim Tebow, right? I mean, people kind of polarize over their opinion of Tim Tebow. Or another guy might be um, Steve Jobs. This was, yeah, Steve Jobs, yep. (laughs) <laughs> Steve has changed over the years. Um, Steve Jobs, you know, some people viewed him as a genius innovator. Somebody, some people said he was kind of a jerk boss. You know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, but then another, another guy might be uh, Rush Limbaugh. This, you might not recognize him by his photo, but you would know his voice and maybe some of his political views. He's pretty polarizing, right? I mean, you sort of either love him or hate him. Um, and then another person who's pretty polarizing is President Obama, where people get you know, a little testy sometimes. So people can be very polarized over leadership. These are the kind of people who, in social situations, they're either going to be the glue that makes conversation really easy or a wedge that makes conversation pretty awkward, right? These are pretty polarizing people. And I think we get pretty polarized. We have a tendency to polarize, especially over things like politics. I mean, politics are the classic example of polarizing leadership. And in some ways, I think a democratic republic, that's our form of government in America, I think that's, it's kind of ruined us for evaluating leadership because we, the people, are the boss, right? And so anybody who's serving in, in public office, they're a public servant, which means they serve the public. And since we have a voice, we have a vote, we feel justified. Whenever somebody veers from the intended path we had for them, we feel justified in kind of lighting them up, right? I mean, we feel like, hey, I've got a voice, I've got a vote, they better do what I say, Now, and I get that. I mean, I totally do. I will say that sometimes I think we act more like Americans than like Christians because the Bible has a lot to say about respecting leadership no matter who they are and how they act. But that's another thing maybe. Um, But the, the fact is we feel pretty justified in lighting up political leaders. And I get that. I really understand. In a representative form of government, I understand why we feel like we have the opportunity, the voice, we have the right to speak up. We don't, we don't feel like our interests are being represented well. And I really do, you know, I understand that. And whether it's a politician or, a, you know, a famous athlete or a celebrity, sometimes when we evaluate leaders, we have a tendency to be pretty polarizing. We allow these things to polarize us into different groups. Um, but there's a thing, here's the thing. I feel like there's another group of people that's pretty polarizing, and that's pastors or church leaders. People can bring that same sense of, you know, the way we evaluate politicians or celebrities or sports stars, they can bring that same mentality to church, and pastors end up being kind of a polarizing, um, a polarizing form of leadership in our world today. In fact, I would say this way, that when it comes to unity, our attitude toward church leaders has the power to either bind us or to break us. Our attitude towards le- church leadership across the board has the power to either bind us or to break us. And it's just true. I mean, I think Paul knew that. Paul is the guy who wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians to the people in Corinth. And he knew that leaders were a hugely, church leaders were a hugely polarizing force. In fact, he's been writing in 1 Corinthians. The first four chapters are all about unity. And we've already talked about or addressed this leadership issue before. 
remember, if you've been here in our series, you might remember talking about, you know, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ. The Corinthians were, uh, had all these fissures or cracks or groups or factions within the church based around leadership. And so by the time we get to chapter 4, the last part of our mini-series called Fighting for Unity, Paul is really going to go after this issue of leadership. He's going to attack this thing of how people view leadership, which I would suggest Paul views as the heart of the disunity problem in the Corinthian church. And because it really is true that when it comes to unity, our attitude toward church leadership has the power to bind us or break us. Or I might say it this way, that church leaders are either the strongest means of unity development in our church or the strongest cause of unity destruction. Church leaders really are the strongest means of unity development or the strongest cause of unity destruction. And you might kind of kick against that and say like, well, wait, well, isn't our unity based on like the gospel or the Bible or the Holy Spirit or something spiritual like that? And I guess the truth is yes. We, I 100% agree. We said that the centrality of our unity is Jesus Christ crucified. And Paul said he didn't want to know anything but Jesus Christ crucified. So our unity with Christians or Christ followers around the world or throughout all time is through the cross, no doubt. But when it comes to day-to-day kind of daily operations in the life of a local church, unity will rise and fall on how people view leadership. It'll either be the strongest cause of unity development or of unity destruction. And I think one proof of this would be um, that, ha- that you know, church leaders can either bind us or break us. A proof of that would be that churches will sometimes split. And if you didn't grow up in church, you might not know about how this happens. But what will happen is a church will exist in town. It'll have a doctrinal statement. Everybody agrees on it. And then some, at some point, that church might split, not in a good way, in a bad way. And they'll split, and they'll make two basically identical churches in the same town with the same doctrinal statement. And the only difference is it's got half the number of people and a different pastor, right? It's just the same church, just with different pastors. And why did they split? Well, they didn't split over biblical interpretation. They didn't change their view on homosexuality. They didn't disagree on when Jesus was coming back someday. They didn't split over theology. They split over personality because truly our attitude toward church leadership has the ability to either bind us or to break us. And so it's super important that we view this issue um, rightly. And we're going to be talking all about today putting pastors in their place, okay? And when I say that, some of you might get a little too excited um, and you might feel like your spiritual gift is criticizing pastors. Um, <laughs> But seriously, I hope that today we will be able to get a proper view of church leadership for the sake of our unity, all right? So hopefully you're already in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 in your Bible. Uh, maybe you're on page 925 if you're using one of our Bibles. I'd encourage you, you know, we're going to, maybe, maybe some things today will resonate with you. Love it if you wrote it in there. We're all about this series, writing in your Bibles. We call it a mark it up series so that 10 years from now you can remember these kind of things. In fact, um, Maybe one of the important things you would want to remember is here's, here's what I would say is an outline of 1 Corinthians 4. Paul's going to start off, and he'll establish the standard. He was going to go after what it means to be a church leader. He'll establish that standard. And then he's going to address the problem, what he thinks is the root issue in the Corinthian church. And then finally, he provides a solution. So we'll come back to this framework throughout, the, throughout this um, sermon. And just so you know, we're about to dive into a ton of content. So I'm going to ask you kind of, you know, sit down, buckle up. We're going to run through this passage. And it might not feel like it applies to you, but in the very end, we'll give a ton of thoughts about application. So just put your thinking caps on with me for a couple minutes and we'll fly through it. So first of all, establishing the standard. Let's go after that. Paul is going to establish the standard. And in this passage, where he begins is in leader's identity. So he starts off to establish the standard with their identity. So let's grab our Bibles and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Here's what he says. He says, this then is how you ought to regard us. Okay, well, right off the bat, who is us? Who is he talking to? Who does that pronoun refer to? Well, in this context, he does talk about the apostles, and he later on, he'll talk about the apostles again. And now the apostles... Um, Those were the group of church leaders in the early church, but they were also a specific group of people who, after Jesus died, saw him alive and saw him before he um, ascended or went back to heaven. So that was a a pretty specific group of people. But beyond that, he also includes a guy named Apollos in this chapter as he talks about us. And Apollos wasn't an apostle. He was just a church leader or a pastor. So I think for our context, we can, ass- we can assume the way that I believe Paul wrote this, when he's referring to us, he's referring to what we would call pastors or church leaders. So for this entire chapter, it's all about pastors and church leaders. So this then is how you ought to regard us. He's going to get into their identity. He says, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. 
So first of all, their identity, they are servants of Christ. These, these pastors, these church leaders, they're servants of Christ. And now this term, servants, this would not have been a glamorous term. Okay, this would have, in fact, this would have highlighted the great insignificance of these leaders. If this would have been a mundane, difficult, non-glamorous job of being just a straight-up, boring servant. And Paul says that that's who church leaders are. They are servants of Christ. Now, really, in some sense, that's nothing significant because anyone who's a Christ follower is ultimately a servant of Christ. Right? We've all been called to serve Christ above any person or above anything. We are all truly servants of Christ. So maybe this part of their identity isn't anything um, specific to pastors. But he continues on and says they're servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. So they're servants of Christ and they are those who have been entrusted with a task. Now this, this phrase, those entrusted with the mysteries, that doesn't sound like a title to us, but the way that Paul wrote this, it would have immediately brought to mind a specific type of slave, okay? It would have been a slave who was the head slave in a given household. This would have been the slave who, in the absence of the homeowner, would have been responsible for, you know, making sure certain tasks got done, instructing people on how to do their jobs properly, issuing discipline if they didn't do their job properly. This was the guy who was ultimately in charge of the household. So was he, did he have authority? Absolutely he did. But... Was he any more valuable than any other slave? No, he was just a slave. Uh, did anybody think he owned the home? Were they confused about that? Not at all. Everybody knew this guy was just a slave, but his role required some level of authority. If he was going to carry out his task efficiently, it required leadership. And Paul makes that same, uses that same term to describe church leaders. He says, look, they are just servants. They are slaves like everyone else. But at the end of the day, they have been given a task that requires leadership if they're going to carry out that task efficiently. So he says their identity is they are servants of Christ. They're also those who have been entrusted with a task. So that's their identity. But what's their goal? What is it that they're actually trying to do? What's their goal? Well, he continues on. In verse 2, he says, now it is required that those who have been given a trust. Now, what is that trust? Side note. Well, he, he said a minute ago, he says, they are those entrusted with the mysteries. The mysteries, we talked about this two weeks ago. That's the sacred secret, the secret of the gospel, the truth that Jesus came, that he died for people who were far from him so that they could be brought near. It, the, the, those who are pastors have been entrusted with that truth. They must ensure that the gospel is proclaimed, that it's proclaimed regularly, and that it's proclaimed accurately. That is their task. They've been given that task. They've been entrusted with it. Now, he says that those who have been given a trust of proclaiming the gospel, they must prove attractive. No, they must prove charismatic. No, they must prove successful. No, they must prove faithful. It says that their goal is faithfulness. Pastors or church leaders, the standard to which they are called is faithfulness. Now, I want to say, I want to take a second here and kind of give a disclaimer because sometimes I think pastors or church leaders have taken this verse to mean that they essentially, they don't have to work hard at their craft or hone their leadership. They just have to be faithful. But I would say that we pastors have been given such an amazing task They've been given such an amazing calling that it makes sense that in order to be faithful to that calling, that at times we would expect some level of success or if their personality allows some winsomeness or some, the ability to be compelling or the ability to be charismatic and to really galvanize people to action, those things are awesome qualities of faithfulness. But at the end of the day, the one thing that they absolutely must be is faithful to the calling that they've been given. They've been entrusted with the gospel. So... Their ultimate responsibility is to be faithful. So then the question kind of naturally becomes, all right, if their goal is faithfulness, who gets to decide whether or not they were faithful? Paul answers that question. He goes on to describe their evaluator. So we know that their goal is faithfulness. Now who's their evaluator? He says in verse 3, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I don't even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. So basically, Paul says the evaluator of the faithfulness of any pastor or leader is God alone. God alone is the evaluator of faithfulness. In fact, he basically says here, look, Corinthians, I got to be honest with you. I don't really care about your evaluation of my faithfulness. I don't. And in fact, I don't really even care about my evaluation. My conscience is clear, meaning like there's nothing going on between me and God. I think we're good to go. But at the end of the day, even if I feel like that, that doesn't make me innocent. God alone is the evaluator of faithfulness for church leaders or for pastors. 
And th- there's going to be some serious implications, I think, for that later on, which we'll talk about. But at the end of the day, Paul is saying, we are not the judge, God is. And he continues in verse 5 and says, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He says, don't judge, don't judge prematurely. Wait. Well, why should we wait? He says, because he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. And at that time, each will receive their praise from God. So Paul is saying, look, don't judge prematurely because God's going to come. And when he comes, he will evaluate based on a standard that you and I can't evaluate on. He, because God's going to evaluate on what's hidden in darkness. Now, for us, that hidden in darkness phrase sounds kind of sketchy. Like, does, does that mean every pastor has, like, skeletons in his closet that God's evaluating them on? Well, what, what he means is just he even defines it as the motives of the heart. These are standards of faithfulness that we as humans aren't able to perceive. We cannot judge based on motives because we don't know motives. So we shouldn't judge because only God can evaluate motives. We have to wait for him who is the only one who is qualified to stand in judgment. So Paul is saying, don't assume that you know. Only God will dish out the praise based on faithfulness, not us. So that's who they are and that's their goal. Their goal is faithfulness and their evaluator is God alone. So Paul goes on, and he goes on to apply this to the Corinthians in verse 6. Here's what he says. He says, now brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos, meaning I've used Apollos and I as an example, for your benefit. So that, here's his purpose, so that you may learn from the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written, because then you won't be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. Uh, Now, if that that quote, um, don't be, go beyond what is written, that might be in quotations in your Bible. It's because that was likely just a modern proverb, a phrase that would have been common in Corinth. And Paul says, this applies. That phrase applies in this context. So what was happening? Why did it apply? Well, Paul is basically saying, um, the Corinthians were going beyond what is written by making up their own standard of what a good or a bad leader was, and then they were becoming um, filled with pride and puffed up in which leader they followed over against another, and then causing disunity based on those made-up standards. They were they had decided what a good leader was or wasn't, and then they were creating factions within the church based on a totally made-up standard. Their view of church leadership wasn't binding them, it was absolutely breaking them. So Paul says, look, 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 don't do that. I'm giving you the standard. Here's the standard, here's their goal, and here's their evaluator. Now don't go beyond this, because otherwise it will create disunity, because truly, I truly believe this, that our attitude toward church leadership will either bind us or break us. Our attitude toward church leadership will always either bind us or break us. So there, he's established the standard. Um, In 1 Corinthians 4, he's gone over, he's established the standard, and next he's going to move on and address the problem. Now, remember, as we're going to continue on in verse 7, he just talked about how they were puffed up over and against each other based on their made-up standard. It's going to become pretty important. So next, we're going to talk about addressing, addressing the problem in verse 7. Here we go. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? He asks in verse 7 three rhetorical questions right off the bat, and I'm picturing Um, This is Paul, you know, he's been building up on this theme of unity for four chapters. He's just going and going and going after unity. And he gets to verse 7, and he's finally had enough. He is fed up, and this begins a descent. This is like the on-ramp into a really sarcastic part of 1 Corinthians. Yes, sarcastic, okay? And he's going to use this sarcasm in a really biting and um, cutting way because he realizes that the way that they are viewing leadership, in fact, the way they're viewing him is filling them with pride and causing disunity in the church. He's going to address the problem, and the problem is pride. And Paul is going to go after it hard because he doesn't, he doesn't want disunity in the church, and he won't let it be based on their evaluation of him. So here he goes in verse 8. He says, already you have what you want. Already you've become rich. You've become to reign, and that without us. It's, I picture Paul saying it kind of like this. He's like, whoa, whoa, you know what? What am I even thinking? In fact, what, you guys have already arrived. You guys are like spiritual, you guys are perfect. You guys are awesome. In fact, disregard anything I've ever said. Why don't you guys just write the rest of the New Testament? You know what? You're fine. You got it, Corinthians. You guys are awesome. And from what we know about the Corinthians, if they didn't have context to know that this was sarcastic, they probably would have been like, yeah, we are awesome. You know what? 
High fives all around, everybody. We're writing the rest of the New Testament. This is awesome. We are awesome. And Paul is using this sarcasm. He's using this sarcasm to cut their oversized egos down to size. And he continues on. He says this, still in verse 8. How I wish that you really had begun to reign, so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us, the apostles, on display at the end of the procession. Like those condemned to die in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. Um, you know, remember David's video at the beginning of this message? He talked about a war procession. And that's, that's the image that, that Paul is really bringing to mind here. He feels like he and the rest of the apostles, the church leaders, are at the end of that procession being shamed, br- being brought to the arena for public humiliation and death. He's saying that he, they're taking the foolish message of the cross to the world as they were instructed to do, and they're getting nothing but criticism. They're getting nothing but rejection. They're at the bottom of the barrel. But you, Corinthians... Oh, you're so magnificent in all your spiritual wisdom. How could we ever be as good as you? The rest of us apostles are actually obeying, and all we get is thrown in the arena to die. But you, you Corinthians, sit back in your spiritual arrogance, and you judge based on your made-up standards, and you're filled with pride. He continues on in verse 10. We are fools for Christ, but you, oh, you're so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, but we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We're in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we're slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this very moment. Paul is cutting their oversized egos down to size, helping them to see that they think they've arrived by following their made-up standards of leadership, but the truth is that they are filled with sinful pride. What they don't know is that they think they're following after leaders and they're being like their best disciples, but the fact is the way that they live couldn't be further from the way that the leaders that they claim to follow actually lived. Paul is disgusted and his sarcasm undoubtedly made this point. He goes after the problem with great tenacity. Your problem is pride and it's got to stop. So first, He established the standard. He tells them what a leader is, who they are, what their goal is, and who their evaluator is. He goes after the problem. The problem is pride. And now he's going to give a solution. He's going to provide a solution. And here it is in verse 14. He says, I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. He kind of goes back to this fatherly tone and says, look, 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 guys, guys, I'm not trying to shame you. I just want you to know you've had a lot of people that have influenced you spiritually, but at the end of the day, I am your spiritual father. In other words, I'm the one who first introduced you to the gospel, to Jesus Christ. And so look, would you please listen to me? I've got the solution to your pride problem. It's a problem that's got to be addressed. So here's your solution. Check it out in verse 16. He says, look, uh, as your spiritual father, as your authority, here's what I say your solution is. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. He says that the solution is imitation. Now get this, this is kind of weird because to us this wouldn't come across real well. What if somebody came to you and said, hey look, you've got a serious problem with pride and the solution is for you to look and act a lot like me. (laughs) Kind of like, maybe you have a pride problem. I don't know, maybe. You know, that doesn't come across real well to us. But Paul was very confident that he had lived a life the way he had led the church in Corinth was the way God had asked him to lead. In fact, he's so confident, he says in verse 17, for this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. In other words, Timothy's going to come and he's going to remind you what it's like to live like me, to believe how I believe. He believes that their solution was imitation. And I think it's because he believed that this dynamic was at play, and it's true for us as well, that when we choose to intentionally pattern our life after someone else, when we choose to be the student and let them be the teacher, when we humbly decide that they, have, they, they are worth imitation, we begin to imitate their behavior, and there is no more room for pride. That's the greatest demonstration that you've understood the message of your teacher is to, in humility and maturity, follow their lead. So he says that the solution to their problem is imitation. And then finally, he also, he continues on with, in verse 18, I picture him as a father kind of wagging his finger and saying, wait till I get home. Here's where he says, verse 18, some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And then we're going to find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, 
but what power they have. In other words, like, hey guys, proof's in the pudding, and when I get back, we're going to have this out. We're going to find out who's all talk and who's actually got some power around here, okay? So he gives them a firm reminder. This is the last piece of the solution is a firm reminder. He says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. So what do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? He says, look, right now, between now and when I get there, you've got a chance to shape up. And if between now and when I get there, you shape up, I can come in love and with a gentle spirit. But otherwise, I'm coming with a rod of discipline, and daddy's going to figure out this problem in this church. Okay? So he gives a firm reminder. That's the solution. Imitation and a firm reminder that he's coming back. So, wow. We ran all the way through that passage. There was a lot of content. So what in the world does that have to do with us? What does Paul's view of Christian leadership have to do with us? Well, the first group that I want to apply this to is leaders. And when I say leaders, I don't just mean the pastors in our church. I mean anyone who's a leader in our church. Like maybe you leave a ministry or maybe you lead um, a community group. We genuinely believe that you are a, an important part of the leadership structure of our church. You are shepherding and leading the people in your group or in your ministry. So this application, these points of application apply to you. So very first, the very first piece of application for leaders is that spiritual leadership is servant leadership. Spiritual leadership is servant leadership. And here's what I mean by that. As part of their identity, Paul said that, that pastors were servants. And Jesus Christ is the example of the great servant. He washed the feet of those he loved. He could have pulled rank, but he never did. So as a leader, you are a servant. But we also said that Paul said that leaders are also those entrusted with a task. In other words, it's not just servanthood, it's also leadership. And as leaders, we have to understand we've been given a task. And so leader, just like Jesus, who, was, uh, who is our leader, he never pulled rank. So you never should. You have no right to. We have no right to abuse our power. But we need to hone the craft of our leadership and courageously follow through on the task that God has given us. Because it's not for the faint of heart. It's going to take courage to lead the way we should. Spiritual leadership is servant leadership. Second of all, it also is hazardous. Spiritual leadership is hazardous. Paul described the fact that he felt like he was at the end of the procession headed into the arena for a shameful death. And spiritual leadership sometimes will feel like that to us as well. Where we, maybe as a spiritual leader, you receive abuse that's not, you shouldn't receive. It's wrongful abuse. Or you're accused of things that aren't true. Or maybe people just get frustrated with you or disregard you or whatever it is. They're, the reality is, no one was abused wrongly more than Jesus Christ. And if we're following after our master, Jesus said that a slave is not greater than his master, and we should expect abuse because he did. So, spiritual leadership is at times going to be hazardous. Second of, I mean, thirdly, spiritual leadership demands faithfulness. And this is a tough thing. Because our ego is screaming, make them happy. The pressure in our organization says, be successful. The, you know, whatever's going on in your life, your culture is saying, you've got to change your view on that. But God has called you to faithfulness. Faithfulness to the task of proclaiming the gospel. And so ruthlessly pursue faithfulness in your home, in your parenting, in your marriage, in your teaching, in your leading, in your preaching. Make sure you are faithful. If you are nothing else, you must be faithful, even in your motives, maybe even especially in your motives. God demands faithfulness and nothing else. Spiritual leadership demands faithfulness. And then finally, spiritual leadership is setting the pace. It's setting the pace. And this is, a t I, want, I want us all as, as leaders to ask a question here together. And it's a really tough one to answer. I'll admit, it's tough for me, it's tough for everyone, but I think it's an important one to ask. And it's this. If someone were to begin imitating me, would their problem with sin be better or worse? That's tough, right? If someone were to begin living their life like me, would they be taking steps toward godliness or away from godliness? Because Paul felt like he could say to the Corinthians, hey, look, you've got a problem with pride? Live like me. He would say later, um, follow me as I follow Christ. He felt like he was on a journey that was worthy of being followed. So the question is, as a leader, are we? Are we living a life that makes sense? If you are like me, you'll become more like Jesus. Ask that question and ask it honestly. It's a tough one. But for the leadership of our church, it's important. If it's not true, we've got some work to do. Spiritual leadership is servant leadership. It truly, it truly is hazardous. It demands faithfulness, and it is setting the pace. So for everyone else, everyone else got to tune back in. If, even if you're not a leader in our church, here's the, how this applies to, I believe, everyone else in our church. First of all, only evaluate on God's standard. 
That's the first thing. Only evaluate on God's standard. You can evaluate church leadership. Okay, I got to admit, because this statement makes me a little nervous. Only evaluate on God's standard. Makes it seem like I'm saying you can't evaluate church leadership. You can and you should. I'm not advocating brainless, mindless, brainwashed people who do whatever the pastors say. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that when you evaluate, make sure you evaluate based on God's standards. Because the Bible has a lot to say about how we do church and how pastors should be and how they ought to act. But there's a lot of things about church that aren't spelled out clearly in the Bible, which means there's going to be a lot of opinions and preferences involved. So make sure as you evaluate, and you should, make sure you're evaluating based on the standards that God has given, not on just opinions and preferences. Because God has given that pastor or leader a task, and they are ultimately accountable to him. So make sure you evaluate based on that standard. And then second of all, leave the ultimate evaluation to God. Leave the ultimate evaluation to God. And again, this is a point that makes me a little uncomfortable because, you know, I I don't want to give the wrong impression, but at the end of the day, I, these words aren't really mine. In fact, if you'll grab your Bibles back in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, here's what Paul directly says. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. These are really Paul's words, not mine. We need to leave the ultimate evaluation to God. That's stronger than I would feel comfortable saying it, but that's the way that Paul said it. We can't evaluate motives, so we ultimately must trust that God will evaluate and give the praise based on his standard. So, only evaluate on God's standard and leave the ultimate evaluation to God. And then third, church leaders aren't dictators, but they are called to lead. Church leaders aren't dictators, but they are called to lead. And this is an important concept that I think we understand with, that we need to understand with balance. And there's another New Testament passage that I think helps flesh this out a little bit, and it's Hebrews 13, 17. Here's what it says. It says, these are two church members. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because... They keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that, for the purpose of, that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. So what should church members do? What is this commanding that they do? They are commanded to have confidence in their leaders and to submit to their authority. That's the main emphasis. Have confidence and submit to their authority. Now, (laughs) Again, this is a, is a concept that's a little tough to talk about because I, I, this has been abused. And leaders or pastors are not unquestionable. They're not perfect. They're not unassailable gurus who speak from on high with unquestionable authority. No way. But they aren't elected officials, elected officials who can be disregarded or dismissed just based on popular opinion either. So yeah, if you feel uncomfortable with the direction of a church that you're a part of, I get it. Ask hard questions. Be respectful. Take a pastor out to breakfast. Get on the team that makes those decisions. Ask the why question. Find out why they're headed in that direction. But understand ultimately that God has given these church leaders a commission. And the Bible's command is that people in their church should submit to make their job a joy. So let me ask you this question. Are you making church leaders' job a joy? And here's how you can test. There's a little quick self-test that might be actually a little bit of fun if you're brave enough to do it. Go up to your community group leader, maybe your community group coach, maybe one of our pastors, one of the leaders of our church, and just ask them this. Hey, when I walk up to you on a Sunday morning, do you get nervous, excited, or depressed? Okay? Because if they're willing to answer that question honestly, it might give you a good sense about how well you're doing with Hebrews 13, 17. Okay? So that's a decent little self-test. Um... I'm giving myself a pass. Nobody's allowed to ask me that today, okay? You've got to ask some other leader. But um, yeah, it's, it's just important that we understand they're not dictators. They're absolutely not dictators, but they are called to lead, so it's important that we view them that way. And then fourth and finally, we have the peacetime luxury of church options. We have the peacetime luxury of church options. And here's what I mean. We live in a time in the world that's pretty unique, where we have a lot, a ton of amazing churches, not just in our city, but around the world. We have lots of places where you could go that teach the gospel that are great, awesome churches. And in a group of people, here's just a reality, in any organization, church or otherwise, there will always be a percentage of people who are unhappy, right? There will always be. It's just the nature of getting a bunch of people in the same room. And, and people will always tell a pastor or a leader, like, Hey, they'll remind them of that fact. There's always going to be somebody who is unhappy, so just lead on, pastor. We're with you until they're in that percentage that's unhappy, right? And then that's when that statement becomes a little tough. Nobody likes to be in that percentage that's unhappy, even though we know it's true in every organization. 
But what's cool is because we live in a world, we have this luxury where there are lots and lots and lots of great churches, I would encourage you to think about this this way. If you find yourself in a situation where you're constantly kicking against church leadership, where you can't find, you can't seem to get on board with the direction of where they're headed, if you've had those meetings, if you've been respectful, but you still can't get on board with where things are headed, especially on these issues of opinion or preference, for the sake of unity, give your pastor a break, okay? They've been called to lead that church, and chances are they feel like they're going in the direction that God tells them to go. So I would, I would encourage you to think about it this way. Go to a place, find a church where it's easy for you to obey, Hebrews 13, 17. Find a church where it's easy to obey that have confidence and submit command, okay? There are people in our church right now who came from another church. You came because you couldn't get on board. <clears throat> you felt like you were always kicking against the leadership. They weren't going the way you thought was best. So you left and you came here, and that's great. We're okay with that. And there are people who are sitting here right now who are having all the thoughts I've just described, but they're having them about Northridge, and that's okay. We will never, we never want to chase people out of our church, and we don't, we're not looking for transfers from other church, but at the end of the day, we have the peacetime luxury of lots of great church options, so go to a place where it's easy to obey Hebrews 13, 17, okay? Don't torture your pastor. Don't drive yourself crazy. It's okay to go to a church where you enjoy going, all right? But as a side note, if you are the kind of person who year, every couple of years, you're changing churches and you never seem to find a church, you've got this long list of places you've gone that have never met your standard, maybe the problem wasn't the long list of churches. Maybe it was the common denominator. And so take a second and maybe realize that you might have some unrealistic or even unbiblical standards of what a church or what a leader should be. And maybe you need to turn that evaluation into the mirror so that you can make church personally a place where it is a joy to serve and to live, because I will say this, there will come a day, probably in America not that far away, where we won't have the luxury of choosing from a myriad of churches. When the American church goes underground, we won't be arguing or quibbling over leadership styles. We're gonna be linking arms for the sake of the cause of the, cro of the cross of Jesus Christ. We will be unified over the gospel. We won't be arguing about small things anymore. But in the meantime, don't torture yourself, don't drive your pastor crazy, go to a place where it's easy to obey Hebrews 13, 17. So, for the sake of unity, let's put pastors in their place. Let's think rightly about leadership, because if we do, we can, we can, um, they can bind our unity instead of breaking it. They can be the means of unity development rather than the means of unity destruction. Our cause is worth being unified for. So let's put pastors in their place for the sake of unity. Would you pray with me? God, thanks for a chance to um, go to a great church. There's lots of them in our city, and we're so thankful what you're doing um, for the gospel in the city of Rochester. And I pray you'd continue to use Northridge and its leadership and the people um, to make your gospel known in this city. I pray that we'd be unified for that cause. We love you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Here at, here at Northridge, we believe that unity matters. We believe it matters a lot. And if we believe that unity matters, then we need to commit to having a proper view of leadership because the way that we view leadership will bind us or it'll break us. We must be unified. And if you're newer to church or you're new to Northridge, you might wonder, like, why is unity so important? Well, unity is so important because we believe we've been entrusted with the message that Jesus Christ came to die. And he came to die to bring people who are far from him close to him. People who are enemies become enemies his children, and that can be you. And, and one of our pastors will be down front after the service, and he'd love to talk to you. Maybe talk to the person who brought you. We would love to introduce you to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And church, that's why we're here. We wanna be unified for that express purpose. And next week is Easter. It's the Sunday where we remember that Jesus didn't just, just die, he came back to life. So let me encourage you. Whatever valid reasons or excuses you have for not inviting any other time of the year, I've got them too. Put them down this week. Put them down this week. Make this the week where those people on your Pi Squared list get a personal invitation with an invite card from you to come to be here next Sunday. It's a service designed for people who are unsure if Jesus is alive, much less if he has anything to do with their everyday life. It's a perfect invitation time. So now's the time, this week, Let's push toward unity and let's be unified this week as we invite those people in our lives who are far from God.
Thanks so much for being here this morning. We can't wait to see you at one of our seven services across three campuses next week. Have a great week.